at this here, you know, when you look at the, the lineup that these brothers put here today, I mean, it's almost like I don't even really have to do a lecture. I mean, the pictures are all speaking for themselves. The thing is, is that anybody who walked in this door today, they would look at these pictures and assume that this is artwork from Africa. You'd have to assume that this artwork is from the motherland. You can go all over Africa, east, north, west, and south, and you'll find faces like that from Egypt to South Africa, or Zania as we like to call it, West Africa, East Africa, everywhere you go in Africa, you see faces like that. And so anybody who is in their right mind, who walks in this door and see those faces, they'd have to assume that this was in Africa. So the fact that this is not in Africa, but this is in America, and every single one of them predates, predates not only Columbus, but predates Christ in most cases, this is phenomenal. And so a lot of us, we take it for granted. We read the book, Unexpected Faces in America by uh, Von Wootenau. We read uh, The Raw Expedition by Thor Heyerdahl, The Black Discovery of America by, by Michael Bradley, and of course, the, the novel work, the work of works we, that came before Columbus by the man, the vanguard, the brother that brought to my attention, the man who deserves all the credit for this particular area, the man who is really on the forefront and pursuing the issue when no one else would do it, Ivan Van Sermon in his book, They Came Before Columbus. So this is not a joke. No, this is not a game that we're playing here. We're talking about the history of our people. We're talking about the lies of the people on the planet Earth, the people who have told lies about African people who said we had nothing to do with the development of civilization. Everywhere I've gone in the world, I've had to deal with people and their attitudes with, about black people, about our people. They look at us, we're the invisible man. You read the books. Nobody knows my name by, James, by Baldwin. Uh, the Invisible Man. You, we read all these books, and then you go right outside. You start standing in line the other day, just standing in the line, next in line, ready to pay for my lunch. The white woman looked right past me and asked the white boy standing right behind me, how many, how many items did he have? I wasn't even there. Here's a cashier, a dumb ca cashier, looking past, and I've traveled all over the world, going everywhere trying to find the truth for our people to bring back to teach the truth to our people, and she can't even give me the respect of giving me uh, 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 the proper due of standing in line, I'm first in line, won't even ring my, my little vegetables up. <laughs> I taught her how to grow vegetables. <laughs> Didn't know rice growing in Europe. There was no watermelon and onions and garlic growing in Europe. Ain't your mama's on the pancake box because she showed the slave master how to cook. Uncle Ben is on the rice box because he cultivated the rice. He brought it from West Africa. Why do you think all these black people are on the boxes? The first schools that we developed, Tuskegee, Voyeurs, all the schools back east were agricultural schools. Bringing the knowledge from Africa of how to develop and cultivate the crops. The white man was dying at 30. You remember Ponce de Leon? He was looking for the fountain of youth. The Europeans, if they lived to be 35 years old, they were lucky. They were dying at 35. This is why at 17 and 18 and 16, they were out on the seas trying to learn navigation, trying to learn as much as they could learn as quickly as they could because they didn't expect to live very long. Syphilis and gonorrhea rampant throughout Europe, all the diseases that devastated Europe constantly. In fact, if it wasn't for the great fire in the 1600s, it may not have even been a Europe. In fact, I believe they may have even set that fire on purpose just to save England. But this is important that we start to look at our history. I remember years ago, I don't know how many years ago, I saw John Henry Clark say that he had inquired about African history and no one really seemed to know the answer. And, and in speaking to an elder, I forget who it was exactly, it may have been Arthur Schomburg, he stated that, I believe it was Arthur Schomburg, that when you look at European history, then you'll find our history. Because without our history, there is no European history. And so it's, it's funny that the first great civilization, the first great high culture to develop in Europe was not in Scandinavia. It wasn't in the Aryan Germany where the Aryan race was supposed to be the supreme race. The Germans didn't develop the first civilization in Europe. It wasn't in the Norway or all the, the nations of the north in Europe. It was in the nation that was closest to Africa. Not even on the mainland of Greece, but in the little islands that sprinkled throughout the Mediterranean world, the islands of Crete, Knossos, the Mycenae civilization. These civilizations were the first civilizations to flourish in Europe and to bring a sense of civilization to that particular land. And isn't it funny that when you find the first great monumental structures that come into America, the presence in America, that you find it on the Gulf Coast of Mexico, off the coast, right off the coast you find the first pyramid in America dating back to 1200 BC in an area called Leventa. In an association, in a conjunction with this particular pyramid, you find these faces. The 
the scientists, those people who study anthropology and archaeology and, and all the other ologies that go along with it, they, they choose to look past the faces. They all recognize none of them have differed with this. They all recognize that this was a foreign people who had come into this particular land at this particular time. But they just refused to look at the faces that you see here today. And if you walked in the door without knowing what we're talking about, you would assume that these are African sculptures. They refused to look at the, even the possibility that it was Africans that came over to the Gulf Coast of Mexico. It's important. You know, I just, I just want to say a few more things about this. No, none of us really get anywhere without other people. You know, Patah Hotep said, consult the ignorant and the wise because the limits of art are never attained. Elbows are useless at the great chamber. You know, all of us must sit according to our rank and according to our seat. It's the respect of our elders, the respect of our ancestors that really gives us the power, the energy, and really the wherewithal to stand up and be somebody in this world. You don't need to walk in somebody else's shoes. You don't have to try to usurp that which somebody else has done. All you need to do is to study and take note and give credit where credit is due and then stand on your own two feet. You don't need to copy people. And this is our problem. We're too busy copying, getting down and getting funky at a time that we need to get up and do some work for our people. Copying everything white folks, cutting our noses, frying our hair, doing everything that we can do to look like somebody else. When a man like George E.M. James writes a book called Stolen Legacy and even offers up his life, gives his life, is murdered for writing the book. And most, most 99% of all of us in America will, will never read this book. And this is a man that gave a book up to show how the Greeks took everything out of Africa. Philosophy, architecture, and you name it. They just came in, took it out, and then told a lie about it. So, I, you know, I get angry sometimes because we have to go through a lot to really bring information to you. You know, you, you, if you knew, I see, I see faces in here, people that I've been with for years. I've known for years, Sister Omawali and others. A number of faces I see here today. And uh, you know, if I could tell you the brothers and sisters that we've lost along the way, brothers who've died in this struggle, you know, people's families have been destroyed in this struggle, all kinds of things have happened in the struggle, but yet we continue, I see the faces, they continue to pursue it. They don't give a damn about Superfire and the Mac and these movies that come out in the, in the, new, the new generation of movies that they got on the scene now. We are unbending, unyielding, and we continue the course. And so I just hope, and I can't emphasize that the young people here persevere this and don't get, get distracted by all the foolishness and all the ignorance that they have out here for you because there's enough of it out here. It's important that you be standing there because it's the Sheikh called Bubakaris, it's the Legrand Claves, it's the Ronoko Rashidis, it's the Omawali Files, it's the brother Ashraf Kwamesa Kwesi, this brother who is the godfather of my children, I'm the godfather of one of his children. We've been working together for 10 years out here in this particular struggle. We used to give lectures down at the Muhammad's Temple, number 27, when it was on Crenshaw Boulevard, at a time when it wasn't even popular to really teach on these things. Jacob Bubakar had the First World Alliance. He saw it in New York City, and he saw that it was important to bring history to our people. Nobody came out there to support the program. The program fell apart. So over the years, we've witnessed this time and time again. We get a little bit of thing going, and the next thing you know, it's falling apart. We can't afford to have anything fall apart today. We gotta keep this thing moving, keep it going. You gotta support the African study group. Come out whenever they have anybody to speak. You don't have to be brother, whoever it is out here to speak. If they got something to talk about related to our people, we should come out and listen to it and criticize it. You know, at the end of this, you have a chance to ask questions to see if there's any validity to the allegations that I make here tonight. Don't believe a damn thing I tell you. Just come up and look at me and ask me the question, ask me to support what I say. To hold me responsible and accountable for what I say. You know, this is important that we do this. This is how we all grow. And so I, I won't get, go any further with this. We turn the projector on and get into the, to the lecture. Maybe I'll tell you a little bit more about myself uh, as we go along here because I want to make sure we get through this whole thing. Thank you. This is one of the brothers we lost along the struggle here. In fact, the last time I saw a sister here, Sister Omawali Files, we were at the services for this brother, brother who has worked with us. In fact, he met Brother Quasey before I did. He was the first brother that Brother Quasey met when he first came to Los Angeles. In fact, the brother helped the brother get his first job out at UCL, UCLA Medical Center. And we should all thank Brother Rashid, if for nothing else, for that, because the job that, yeah, give Brother Rashid a hand. <laughs> 
because I can hear the brother right now. Everybody knows how the brother is. He, you know, you can hear him right now. Yeah, brother, go home, brother. You know brother Rashi. He's always been there, and he's always worked with the children, worked the children's space. You always find a brother in Linwood and Compton on Central Avenue and out in East LA. He was always in the trenches where nobody wanted to go. He grew up in the trenches just like I did. We grew up in the same neighborhoods in East LA, uh, around Crenshaw Boulevard. I shined shoes at the age of nine on Central uh, Central Avenue. The Muslims used to come down and get their shoes shoes shine, and this is how I began to grow as a young man. Began to look at to, look into our history. But brother Rashid, you see him standing in front of the the great temple of Hathar on the island of Philae in front of the temple of Aset, which we call the temple of Isis. And on the facade here, you see in the background, the goddess Hathor. Now she is the goddess and queen of the West. The West in ancient Kemet, let me say this, the ancient Egyptians were the first people on earth to unify themselves as a nation. They were also the first people on earth to have a system of land use uh, classification and urban planning. This is important. We just read past this stuff. They said that the mortuary temples would be so situated on the west. The burial sites would be situated on the west. On the eastern side of the Nile, we will have our institutions and we will have our living quarters. So today, when you go to buy a piece of property, you go and you buy a piece of property in a residential district, which they call the R district. R1, R2, R3, R4, R5, residential. One is multifamily, one is duplex, one is single family. This is land use classification. And when you get ready to build, if you want to build a cemetery or mortuary, you have to use an M zone. So they had an M zone long before the United States knew what an M zone was. This is the first system of land use, uh, land use classification. And so the queen of the west, the queen of the western side of heaven was the goddess which we call Het Haru or Hathor. And so we know in our hearts that Brother Rashi, who has gone on to the ancestors now, has made his way to the west, to the western side of heaven. And today the brother is looking down upon us and he's giving us encouragement and He's probably eating a nice dinner and having a good time. And we move on, we can see that this black woman, as Dr. Ben always points out, this goddess Hathor was the very goddess that the Jews actually worshiped when they left the area called Chaldea or Mesopotamia. Remember they said that they worshiped golden calves. Well, this was the, the goddess Hathor, Het Haru. And Moses worshiped, worshiped her for over 40 years. This is important. You can see here again, merging out of the western cliffs, as you can see the tombs here. This is important because one of the things they say in America, and they, dip, they, they try or attempt to differentiate Native American architecture, particularly the pyramids, super, the pyramidal superstructures from the Kemetic or Egyptian superstructures. They say that the Mesoamericans were temples and that the Egyptians were tombs. But we want to clarify this because every temple, every tomb in Egypt was also a temple. As you can see, the temple here uh, in association with the tomb here. Again, you can see the goddess Hathor, the cow goddess of the west, coming out of the tomb here. And this particular pyramid is in the, in, is in the Yucatan Peninsula. And they still haven't completely reconstructed it or uncovered it. But in this particular pyramid, they found the priest lying there with their feet to the east and their heads to the west. Now, I was shocked when I began to study the religion of the Nahal, of the Aztec and the Maya, because I found that the western side of the heaven in the Maya, the Azteca, and all the religions of Mesoamerica, the western side is called the place of women. The place of women. It is the exact same meaning that you have in ancient Kemet. And so here you find the priest laying with his feet to the east and his head to the west, laying in the, inside the pyramid. Again, not just a temple, but also a tomb. And so many of us don't know. In my, t in my lecture, the Egyptian temple, mother of the church, I show how the architecture of the church, as well as many of the religious concepts, come right out of ancient Kemet. They've stolen this right out of our motherland. And so you can see that the basic Canaan and Gothic architecture is the twin towers. The entrance to the temple always faced the west. Wherever possible, they turn it towards the west because the judgment scene, the Necca scene, as we call it in Kemet, was always in the west, even in Christianity. This is something they took right out of Egypt. So here you have in, in Rome, in France, in Greece, where they have come into Africa and learned the concept of land use classification and, and learn order and structure, decide to pattern 
their religious philosophy after ours. And then you find the same concepts there in Mesoamerica. These are things that I want you to, to bear on your mind as we move a, along here. Again, you can see here the, the Gothic cathedrals here, this one being the Cathedral of Notre Dame. You can see here clearly where the scales are being used to determine who is righteous and who is not. And you have this hideous, hideous beast here to devour those who have not been found right and true. Now obviously this comes from the papy papyruses and the scripts in the temples of ancient Kemet. As you can see clearly as the deceased come before the scales to have their hearts weighed against Ma'at or the feather of truth, you have the beast here waiting in anticipation to devour those who are not found right and just. These are concepts that come right out of Kemet and were introduced into the church. And we're going to have to come back and do the temple lecture if y'all want to see more of that. But I just want you to see that these concepts are universal. And we have to begin to ask the question, how did they become that way? And you can see here that in, uh, in the area of Chichen Itza, this particular building, they call the church. And the four cardinal points of the church are represented by zoo types here. On four on each side, you have a, a monkey, a monkey, a, a snail, a turtle, and you also have a man. Now remember in the Bible, you had, uh, you had Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. One was a man, one was an ox, one was an eagle, and one was a, uh, well, I'm missing, a lion. And then this was taken right from Osiris' four sons. One was a man, one was a hawk. One was a baboon, and the other was a, uh, what was a jackal? Yes. Yes. So you got the four sons of Osiris that became the four gospel uh, sons of Christ, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then you have, again, the same concept in association with shock, as you hear, see here, the rain god centered at the four cardinal points. Now, we're going to make all this clear. I'm just kind of like introducing this information here. We're going to get into some real deep stuff as we move along here. So here you can see an ancient Kemet where you have the concept of the four sons here by the canoptic jars in which they put the internal organs into the canoptic jars. And so you find also the concept of the canoptic jars right in the tombs of Mexico, representing the four cardinal points, just as they did it in ancient Kemet. In fact, burials. You know, if you didn't expect to rise up from the dead, there would be no need to put pottery and eating utensils and so forth in your tomb. So the concept of resurrection and renewal is a very important and basic principle in both of these societies. This is mainly what we're going to be doing here, is comparing the Egyptian and Nubian society with that of ancient uh, Mexico. Because this is, in our hypothesis, is where we believe that the brothers and sisters who first made a contact in the Americas came from. And it will become obvious to you as we move along why we've selected this particular region in Africa as being the first one to make the contact. Here you can see uh, the priest king Pakal from the area of, uh, called Palenque, uh, also in, off the Gulf Coast. It's not very far from the Venta area. In fact, I just returned from there just less than a week, just a little over a week ago. And you can see here the concept of the cross here. And this is important because Christianity flourished in America the same reason that it flourished throughout most of Africa. Because many of the principles and concepts of Christianity were already here. They had the concept of a resurrection story and the virgin birth story. You had uh, Cult Q, the mother, the great mother in the Aztec religion. Exhale, the great mother in the Maya religion, who had given birth. In fact, one of them, uh, Cult Q, she had taken a hummingbird's feathers and stuck it into her belt. And uh, then she noticed that she had become impregnated by the feathers of a bird and she bore a holy son. And so this particular son, which is the sun god of the Aztecs, when he came into being, he said to his mother, because he knew his brothers and sisters would be jealous of this particular event, that I will be there to protect you. And so when his brothers and sisters, the moon and the stars came against the, the great mother, it was the sun god who came and defended his mother. A concept of immaculate conception just like that of ancient Kemet, where you find that Isis was impregnated by, well, Isis was impregnated by Osiris, who came in the form of a spirit, in the, in the form of a bird. This is important. We move on, we can see here, at the moment of death, Pakal falling into the underworld, into the jaws of the underworld. Now, what is interesting about that is we know that when you go to the ancestors in ancient Kemet, the first one to meet you at the gates of heaven was a jackal the jackal that we call Anubis. Now, I found this incredible. 
that in the Nahal religion, the Maya religion, that the first stratum, there are nine stratums in their underworld, the very first stratum is the stratum of the river, the great river. There's this long mythical river in the underworld, and the dogs, dogs help the soul to cross the river. This is exactly the same thing that we have in ancient Kemet, where the jackal Anubis greets the departed at the gates of heaven and sends them along the banks of the Nile River to cross into the western side of heaven. The same exact thing. And not only did they use a dog, but they used a coyote. A coyote who is the exact relative of the jackal. Both of them are scavengers. Both of them are used by nature to clean the earth of deceased animals. They're the ones to keep disease off the face of the earth. So they had the exact zoo type. Here in America, as you see the jackal Anubis and the young boy King Tut Ankhamen's tomb, as the first thing Carnarvon and them found when they entered the tomb, facing was the jackal, because he is the one that greets you at the gates of heaven. This is a constant theme throughout ancient Kim. And so you can see Anubis here greeting the departed. The first one you meet is the jackal. Moving on, we can see here, the first one you meet, his heart is being weighed against the feather of truth, is the jackal. So you find in the tombs of Mexico, many of the tombs in Mexico, the dog. Just as you found the jackal, the coyote, to greet the departed at the gates of heaven and to help him cross the first river in the first stratum of the underworld. So how did this get to America? Did they just suddenly come up with this concept by themselves? Brilliant concept, a mythical river, and jackal dogs to help them cross this great mythical river. As I always ask in my other lectures, at what point does possibility become probability? We'll continue on. They tell a story about the area of Tenochtitlan and also Teotihuacan, of how the people had migrated to these particular areas in this great valley, a valley that's surrounded by volcanoes, and in the midst of this is a great lake. And they were told by their ancestors that they would find a lake with an island in the middle of the lake, and on this particular island you would see an eagle devouring a serpent perched on cactus, as you can see here. And where you find this particular place, this is called the place where the gods are born. And this is where they developed the great ceremonial center. Now, to many of us, that may sound familiar. Because we know that when Mena Anarma came down the banks of the Nile River, he came from the interior of Africa, and the place of the falcon where the falcon perched was in the interior of Africa. And it was in the interior of Africa at the equator that the falcon had a struggle with the evil one, Set Typhon, or Apit, the vile serpent. So this particular place was the Kui land, the holy land, the God's sacred land of the ancient Egyptians. And so here you have in America a very similar story for the foundations of one of their societies. And you can see here the, the, uh, the Native Americans, as they look on, as they have spotted this particular island in the lake where you find the eagle devouring the serpent. And then, we have to look at the, the profound implications of this because we know one of the natural predators of the serpent is the hawk and it is the eagle. And so because the serpents were so deadly, could cause, death within, could cause death within a matter of minutes, they knew that there was hope in the symbol of the falcon and the symbol of the eagle because they could, like a hero, swoop down on the serpent, the thing that we fear so much, and just kill it, just like that. And so the symbol of the sun, as they saw the sun in the heavens and the bird in the, in the sky going around and around in the heavens and coming down and attacking the serpent, that became the symbol of the sun god, the symbol of Horus, the symbol of the gods around the world represented generally by birds. And so you can see the concept of the feathered serpent. This represents the fundamental dichotomy of life, the concept of life and death the concept of the earth and the heavens, the concept of good and the bad, the concept of the mother and the man, the, the, the dichotomy of life, the concept of controlling one's bad side versus one's good side, the sum and bottom, the greatest good, as George Jim James talks about in The Stolen Legacy. This is represented by the feathered serpent, the concept of what is godly or what is heavenly, by the eagle or the falcon, and that which is earthly, which is symbolically represented by the serpent. And so this is a fundamental element that you see in both of these societies, the concept of the feathered serpent. Became the very symbol of power in Kemet. For over 3,000 years, it was the very power of the Pharaoh himself. As 
you can see the mortuary temple of Queen Hatshepsut as is reconstructed in this particular uh, piece of art. The concept of the feathered serpent here, all over Kim. Here at the temple of uh, Quetzalcoatl here in Mexico in uh, Teotihuacan, 40 miles outside of Mexico City, you can see the feathered and plumed serpent as it comes down the temple, much like the feathered serpent there at Hatshepsut's temple there at Abari, which we call Zesser Zesseru in ancient times. Again, the feathered serpent, all these things at some point we have to ask, at what point does possibility become probability? You have the concept of pyramid building. The great, the, to borrow a phrase from Saddam Hussein, the mother of all pyramids. The mother of all pyramids right here, and you find here in Mexico, the great pyramid here, if you were to walk in the pyramid of the sun, the base of this particular pyramid is identical. It's identical to the base of the great pyramid there in Egypt. And it's about half the height. Now just imagine this. Now you can see the people on top of the pyramid here. Now you can get an idea of the scale of this. This is a huge pyramid. Now this, this particular pyramid is only half the height of this pyramid. So that this pyramid is so, is so large that the scale, you can't even conceive the scale properly until you put it in conjunction or a comparison with another temple. They found hieroglyphic writing. Hieroglyphic writing here in America. And many of the symbols are very similar to that of ancient Egypt. The letter Ta, which we call land. Ta Mary, I named my little girl. Ta Mary means the born land. Ta Harka. Ta means land. Har means horse or sun. Ka is a spirit, the living, the land or the place of the living spirit of the God. Ta in Mexico meant the same thing. It meant land. You had Ta, Ta Man Khan, which meant also uh, the spirit, the, dwelling, the, the spiritual de dwelling place of the God. The same thing that you had in Kimita being land. There were many, many of them. I won't go into all of them because we want to get through all of this. But there are many similarities in the, in the Mayan uh, religion, in the Mayan writing that is very similar to that of ancient Kemet. And they used to always make fun of us, the cotton picking people. Picking cotton, dancing, and, and all these other things that they said about us and tried to make a negative out of it. Yes, we were associated with cotton. We showed white folks how to make a shirt. This is important. But then they found cotton in America. They found cotton, and Van Serma talks about this all the time. time. They found a hybrid with 26 chromosomes, 13 old world chromosomes and 13 new world uh, chromosomes. And they found that the only way that this cotton could have gotten to America is through human contact. They tried all kinds of ways to get the cotton over to America in bottles going across the water. They sent it, they tried to put it in the beaks of birds, on the feet of birds, all kinds of things, all types of methods to get the cotton across, and all of them failed. The only way they concluded that the cotton could get to America is by human contact. So how did an African cotton become a hybrid cotton with that of a Mesoamerican cotton and be here before Columbus? If he discovered America, is a question. Is that a good question? Yeah. At what point does possibility become probability? And so is, is Professor Ivan Van Serma who wrote the definitive work to bring it to our attention because certainly white folks were, didn't have no intention of bringing it to our attention. And so he wrote this particular book and it was when I first read this book and saw the brother many, many years ago at Compton College when it wasn't really even popular to, 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 to attend lectures at this particular time. They had a small lecture room in the back somewhere and it was half full at this time. But when I first saw this, it just blew me away, blew me away completely. The African presence in America before Columbus. Nobody knows about this. How, where, where, where did he get this kind of information? Where did he get this information from? And did you know that there were white people who were talking about it before Van Sertima, that there were Africans in America? So let's start the concept of navigation. Let's start with navigation because first of all, a lot of people think that Africans can't swim and that Africans don't have boats. <laughs> that Africans don't know anything about navigation. So here uh, in the great temple of Amun, at a pet, I sit, which we call Karnak today. In this particular temple, there is an obelisk here devoted to a queen by the name of Hatshepsut, designed by a brilliant architect by the name of Sinmut. And this particular brother loved this sister. And she said, brother, I would like for you to build me an obelisk. And he said, yes. And not only did he build an obelisk, but he built six of them for the queen. And then she later said to the brother, brother, I need, I'm, I need you to build a temple for me. So he designed this beautiful temple for the sister in the cliffs at Baharu, which we call Zesser Zesseru. And she said, one other thing, brother, 
Is it possible that we can bring some trees back from the sacred land, which they call Pawnee or Punt, the God's land, the Todd Little land, to bring it back and plant it in front of my temple so I can be reminded of the place that my spirit and my soul will travel back to when I go to the ancestors? And so Simba said, okay, sister, I'll make sure you get the trees. Not only did he make sure that he, she got the trees, but he led the expedition himself back into the interior. As you see the brother here, he was also in charge of the education of her daughter here. So the brother went on back as he got into his boat, his ships, not his boats, I'm just, I'm being like the Europeans, calling them boats. He got into a ship with a sail on it and sailed all the way down to Ethiopia to the land of Punt. As you can see, Punt with a question mark here. They're always questioning. I always want to leave it in question. But he sailed down to the land of Punt and got some trees, got into his boat and sailed back up to Kemet and planted the trees in her garden. So don't take my word for it. Let's go to the inscription right there on her temple. He said, Simbud wrote, Punt was established for, for Punt was established for him within his estate. Trees of the divine land were planted on, on both sides of his temple in his garden. Now this is important because him is, is in res, respect to Amun, the god Amun. So he had brought these particular, in fact, Queen Hatshepsut obviously being the pharaoh was the personification of Amun. So he had brought these trees back and planted it in her temple, in her honor, to build Punt, to build the Holy Land right here in Egypt, in Kemet. Now this is important that we get this in perspective because the Nile River is the longest river in the world, 4,100 miles long. Now the United States from coast to coast is how many miles? Approximately 3,000 miles, right? So we're talking about, we're not talking about getting in the boat and sailing from here, from Long Beach to Santa Monica Beach. We're talking about getting into a boat and traveling several thousand miles. You can't do that in a canoe. This was a ship. He sailed all the way down to the land of Punt and brought back cargo, brought back monkeys, brought back bananas, brought back trees and planted all kinds of trees. Jewelry, gold, all the gold he could get his hands on he got and brought it back to Kemet. This is where Kemet had his mines in the north, in the south, in Nubia, in Ethiopia. There was no gold growing in Egypt. There was a little bit in the uh, Sinai, but not much. Most of it came from the interior. So they were sending expeditions back to God's land all the time. How is it that they came up with the hypothesis that the Egyptians came from the north when in fact they said that their gods had come and were born in the land of Punt and they were sending expeditions back here and bringing back trees to create the condition of heaven right there in Egypt. Now I'm not making this up. James Henry Breston, uh, Willis Budge, Gerald Massey, Albert Churchward, go on down the line. All of them have concur and agree that this particular land was the Kemetic or Egyptian holy land, not Europe as previously believed by detractors. We move on and we can see that very beautiful palace the brother built on the side of the cliffs and brought the trees back to this land and planted it in her garden. Another brother by the name of uh, Harkouf, long before Sinmut, was sent in the sixth dynasty by the King Pepe back into the interior of Africa and he wrote the inscription right here on this particular tomb. I went and visited this, uh, Harkouf's tomb and it was here that he wrote about how he had gone back into the land of Punt, into God's land and not only did he bring back all these things but he brought back a little twat a little pygmy, which the Egyptians call the dancers of God. They call these little people the dancers of God. These were the people that Osiris could sit on his great throne in the interior of Africa and look down into the forest region and they please his heart and his soul as he would watch them do this dance. I didn't write this. This is what the Egyptians wrote themselves. So one white man named Halle who wrote a book called Pygmy Katabu he found out that the Egyptians had identified themselves with the Twa in the interior of Africa. And so he said, okay, well, if the Egyptians were in association with the pygmies and we've already painted the Egyptians white, then we better, we better paint the pygmies white too. So this, because he had to cut, they got to cover all the ground, see? And so this is what he wrote. The Egyptians who identified the far more ancient pygmies with their divine ancestors were full-fledged members of the white or Caucasian race, Caucasoid race. He went on, now you see this is not my book, he went on, he wrote, in brief, the pygmies are not abnormal people, they constitute a race of normally small stature, a strongly individualized race that are entirely distinct from the Negroes. <laughs> 
prominent brows, the thin lips testified to a primordial connection with Europeans. Like the pygmies, Caucasians or whites are very ancient residents of the so-called dark continent. Negroes are not. <laughs> so all these years, all these years we've been looking for our history. We had Malcolm. We had Elijah. We had no more Drew Ali. We had Marcus Garvey. We had all these brothers that come up and try to give us the highlights of our past so that we can understand that we're not of America, that we came from somewhere, from some land. They call it the dark continent with Tarzan swinging on the vine. But then we said at the moment that we thought that we had it, we found out we don't even come from the dark continent either. Where do these poor Negroes come from? Where do these lost souls come from? <laughs> But you can see that the white folks had a problem. Yeah. They said the Egyptians were white. Mm -hmm. Then the Egyptians turned around and said the pygmies were their cousins. <laughs> <laughs> so here's Halle with his cousins sitting in the interior of Africa. <laughs> and we bear no resemblance to the people around him, and he does. <laughs> but this is the logic that prevails in their so-called sciences. And this is why I'm a student of Dr. Yosef Bull Benyakinen. And I almost said Bull before I said Benyakinen because he deals with the bullshit that people teach us. <laughs> and he comes, in 1987, we had a conference in Kimmel. I was there at the conference. The brother put out all kinds of papers, mathematical treatises that he had written about Kimmel. The man has been in Kimmel since 1938. 30 years before Dr. King was murdered, he was already had been studying Kemet for 30 years. He, he was sleeping in tents out in the desert when the Arabs wouldn't let him into the hotels. He's been stabbed, shot, and jailed for teaching Kemet and teaching the truth to our people. And people want to know why the brother is so impatient. Why the brother comes up and he won't adhere to the principles that the academia, academ, I can't even say the word, the academics that they want, he doesn't adhere to it. He has more PhD than all of them. He has been to Kemet down the, the now more times than Sadat went down the now. And yet they want to challenge this man because he comes in a way that the people understand. He got people on crack, people on cocaine, people walking the streets lost, don't know who they are. He's going to stand in front of them and read about a particle falls at 32 feet per second squared and force equals mass times acceleration. We've studied these things. We've studied physics and, and we've studied uh, the English literature and all the, 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 the classics and all this kind of crap that we're supposed to study. But it comes to a point where you begin to understand that unless what you study is associated with your own self and your own endeavors, it doesn't mean anything. Wow. So here they are. They got the toit and they painted Harkouf white. <laughs> Why is it that if, if Harkouf is white, why didn't they put, paint the Twa white and vice versa? So looking at this is no different than looking at Halle and the Twa. Same thing. But they painted the brother, a man who was a governor of the South, a man who grew up in Nubia, in southern Egypt. They painted him white. And so I had a brother take me to Harkouf's tomb. And here's Brother Harkouf. And look at Brother Harkouf. Bears no resemblance to this one. <laughs> In fact, Brother Harkouf, look at Brother Harkouf's lips. He looked just like the brother that showed me Harkouf's tomb. <laughs> so Brother Harkouf is happy today in heaven. We're clearing his name. So they found this piece in Mexico. And they said, wow, how are we going to cover up this one? <laughs> so this is what they wrote about this piece. The Negro features of this head from Veracruz in Mexico seems to testify to the presence in pre-Columbian America of black Africans who were often galley slaves on Phoenician ships. Black slaves, black slaves were, the first, were first introduced by the Spaniards at the beginning of the 16th century. Now, he's got two statements here. I don't understand the last part, but I know the first part is what they traditionally do is whenever you talk about African people, somehow it's got to be the slave land. The old slave people from the old slave land. Always a slave. You historically have always been a slave. Whenever you show up anywhere on the planet, 
There was, I was looking at a, at a screw that was supposed to have been invented by Archimedes going back into uh, Hellenistic times, and they had a brother operating the screw, and they put slave on there. Not an inscription nowhere on the piece, but they just put slave underneath it. Slave operating the screw. <laughs> this is how they treat us. We move on. And so they have Christopher here in bright red, how he came over in 1492. They talk about Eric the Red, Leif Erikson, how he came over. And even with the Phoenicians, they kind of put a dotted line here because it's questionable. And when they do get over and allow them to come over, they say, well, if they came over and if there were blacks with them, those blacks who came over with them were the galley slaves who helped them pedal the ship over here. That's how they treat us. So here we have the Egyptian hieroglyphic of Medunetta writing, which is the parent of the Sinai inscription. The Sinai inscription is the parent of the Phoenician script. The Phoenician script was the parent of the early Greek script. Obviously, the Greek script is the parent of the Roman script, which is the script that we use today throughout the Western civilization. Whether you're in Spain, in France, in Germany, in England, in America, anywhere that you find Europeans and their descendants, you find a script that is Roman, that is Greek, that is Phoenician, that is Sinetic, that is Egyptian. Why did they teach us this in school? Maybe I would have been a better writer if I knew that the letter that I was writing with was the letter that I had invented. They didn't teach us this. So here you find that the Phoenicians are beholden to the Sinetic, and the Sinetic are beholden to the Egyptians, and we know from the latest discoveries in Tarsetti and in Cousteau that the script preceded the Egyptians by several generations in Nubia, then the Egyptians themselves are beholden to the land of Punt, to the God's land. This is important that we make these kinds of parallels. Let's look at the lies that they're telling. Let's look even at the Bible that they say they go by. I go by the Bible. I go by the Bible. Quit going by the Bible. Go in the Bible and take a look at what the lies, the same lie that you've been telling us all the time. Here, here in the Bible, you have in the sons of Ham, Cush, and Mezarim, and Put, and Canaan. Now Ham, we should all be in agreement, White folks were happy to tell us that we were the cursed race. They were happy to tell us that the black race were the hermetic race. Isn't this what they said? So then this should be a consensus amongst even white folks that Ham represents the black nations. I mean, if it's not Ham, who is it? Shem is the Asiatic, and, and Jepheth are the whites. So that leaves Ham the black people of the earth. So let's look at Ham and his progeny. Let's look at his offspring. And the sons of, of uh, Cush, which is the son of Ham, the son of black. So let's put it to this. Let's put it this way. Black had Black Junior, which is Cush. Black Junior, Cush, had, had sons Sheba and Havilah. And Cush, Black Cush, gave a black son named Nimrod. This black son of Cush began to be a mighty one on the, on the earth, and he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore, it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of Black Nimrod civilization was Babel, Erich, Akkad, the very places that we say are the cradle of civilization. This is important because Mazarin, you have to look at the code words, look it up in the, biblical, in the Oxford Biblical Atlas like I did, and you find that Mazarin is Egypt. So Egypt is the son of the black. Ham, the Hebrew word Ham, comes from black, which means birth, a burning. The Egyptian symbol of Kemet, the Cam, was a black burning rock. It was from this black burning rock that the god Kulamun fashioned man, the first man, from the earth. This black burning rock, which they call Kemet, Kemet Ta means the black land, Kemet Tu means the black people, Kemet Nu means the black nation. From this word Kem, or Kem, the Hebrews got the word Ham, which means the black. So these are the black nations, and so it's clear that Nimrod, the founder of Mesopotamia, was an African who had come from Ethiopia, from the land of Cush from the Todd Netter. Well, why, did they, why won't they say this? Where is the preacher at today on Sunday preaching his sermon? Why didn't he say this today in the church? We move on. So it becomes very apparent that the land of Canaan, which is none other than the Phoenicians themselves, the land of Canaan were not galley slaves. Uh, the, he the Ethiopians and the Egyptians were not galley slaves to uh, Canaan, but in fact they gave birth to Canaan, and Canaan was in fact their offspring which is Phoenicia. So see how the lies come back to hunt them when you show them something clear and simple? Here's Canaan, otherwise known as ancient Phoenicia, the offspring of Cush of Ethiopia. But they said that the Phoenicians had galley slaves who were Negroes. 
when they were Negroes themselves according to the Bible. So when we look at this thing, we got to take a good look at this. You know how Willie Mays could run and make a basket catch and turn around and throw a man out at the plate? I bet you Willie Mays could stand right here and throw a ball and hit somebody in the head over there in Lebanon. <laughs> look how close that is to Kemet, to Egypt. The greatest nation on the earth that stood for 3,000 years continuously. 1,000 years by itself as the world's first organized and structured nation. And you mean to tell me some hillbillies and some desert in the desert are going to come up with something all by themselves, a religion all by themselves, navigating principles all by themselves, a, re a language all by themselves. But when you look carefully at the situation, you find that the language is coming from there, the oral tradition is coming from there, the written tradition is coming from there, the monuments are coming from there, all of it is coming from the Nile Valley. Look how close it is. Take a swim down the coast. Take a dinner cruise and come back home. This is what the pharaohs were doing. They controlled these seas for almost 3,000 years. Nothing came in, the, in here to destroy Kemet until the very end. So when you look at this art, you say, wow, those, that's some beautiful Kemetic art. The only problem is that this is not Kemetic art, this is Phoenician art. So the Phoenician art began to reflect that art of the teacher. Just like the things that we do today in America reflect those who've taught us. Again, this looks like Osiris, or the crown of Osiris. But this is a Phoenician crown. And when you look at the pharaoh Sesostris of Sinusra, his crown is no different from the crown of the Phoenicians. Because this is where they got it from, from him. This brother colonized the Mediterranean world. Him and his, uh, in, in, those who preceded him. In fact, according to Herodotus, he had developed a colony as far up as the Black Sea. This whole area was under Kemetic colonization. And well, don't take my word for it, let's go to Herodotus. He wrote, and the Egyptians talking about these people, the Greeks were trying to figure out, well, how did these black people get all through this area? How did they get up here? And Herodotus said, well, I think that they were probably from Sesostris' army because, as we know, thousands of years before I was born, before I got any education, I read that the Sesostris had a colony of blacks all the way up to that area. And so this is how he wrote it. The Egyptians did, however, say that they thought the original Colossians were men from Sesostris' army. My own idea on the subject was based on the fact that they have what? Black skins and woolly hair. And not that that amounts to much as other nations have the same, such as India. And secondly, and more especially, on the fact that the Colossians, the Egyptians, and the Ethiopians are the only races which from ancient times have practiced circumcision. So not only did they have the black complexion, not only did they have uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, actually the right of circumcision, but the whole concept of culture was intact, all the way up to the Black Sea, to show you how much power the Egyptians had at this particular time. And the Greek, he was 450 years before Christ, he's writing this. This is how he saw it. Egypt at this time was under Persian occupation. He didn't have to write that. He could have wrote what he wanted. He was, a, he, was a, he was a citizen. He was in Egypt because it was being dominated by foreigners. But even though he was, he was there because of that domination, he still wrote the truth. He said these people were black. So you see Brother Sesostris here who colonized the entire Mediterranean. Looking at the art, it just, it's the same art. You can see time and time again. When you look at Phoenician art, it's the same art as that of the Egyptians. So you're going to tell me that they are taking us as slaves and we're teaching them? Showing you them coming as very dark and plucky, showing them that they're related to Africans, bringing tribute right there in ancient Kemet from Phoenicia. You can see the ships used by Sesostris. We're talking about a period about 2300 BC. We're talking about nearly, we're talking about 4,300 to 4,500 years ago that they had ships like this with sails on it, navigating throughout the Mediterranean world. It's not a canoe. They had larger ships than this. They were shipping obelisks all the way down from the interior of Africa. So here you can see now they begin to find the evidence. Digging up all over the Mediterranean world, you're starting to find shipwrecks of Egyptian ships off the coast of Greece, going back to 1400 BC and further. The first civilization
populations, again, as I stated, that grew up in, in Europe, were not in Europe, were not on the mainland of Europe, nowhere near the mainland of Europe. They were right in the Mediterranean, right next to Africa. So in case you think that my scholarship is lacking, I chose to bring one of the European scholars, one of their champions, in fact, founded at the first school of Egyptology in America, University of Chicago School of Oriental Studies, James Henry Breasted, who writes in his book, Conquest of Civilization, in case you want to refer to it, he writes, because of their nearness to Egypt, it was on the Aegean Islands and not on the mainland of Europe that the earliest high civilization on the north side of the Mediterranean grew up. From the beginning, the leader in this civilization of the Aegeans was the island of Crete. The little sun-dried brick villages forming the late Stone Age settlements of Crete received copper from the ships of the Nile by 3000 BC. Man, I don't have a PhD, but he had one, so if you don't believe me, maybe you'll believe him. <laughs> Move on. You can see as he continues, while the great pyramids of Egypt were being built, the Cretan craftsmen were learning from their Egyptian neighbors the use of the potter's wheel and the closed oven for baking pottery. Breasted continues, and many other important things. Goes on. They rapidly learned the art of what? Navigation from the Egyptians. Their ships, the earliest uh, sailed by Europeans, were so numerous that their rulers are often called the Sea Kings of Crete. So here you have, they wouldn't even be Sea Kings if it hadn't been for the brothers here coming here teaching them navigation as far back as 3000 BC. But Dr. Ben and his, his students, they're emotional. They're emotional, they don't deal with facts. See, there's a difference between being emotional and presenting facts with emotion. We have to learn how to make that distinction, how to differentiate between those two qualities. We move on, we can see that Isis was also considered to be the goddess of the navigational period. The Greeks and the Romans actually worshipped her as a goddess who opened up the ceremony of navigation during a festival which they called in the Navigium Asutis about March 5th every year to open up the spring. Now you may see a picture of a god, I don't have it in this lecture today, but sometimes you see on the bow of a ship a woman. The virgin represented on the bow of the ship goes all the way back to Isis who was considered to be the queen of navigation. And don't take my word for it, let's go here to Alexander Moret's book, Kings and Gods of Egypt, as he writes, they crossed the sea yet again in trading vessels and their coat was spread abroad by the merchants and sellers who all worship Isis, star of the sea. Protector of seafaring men leaving the ports of the Hellenic Mediterranean, their galleys sail along the coast of Italy, Gaul and Spain. That's France, Gaul in Spain, bringing the worship of Isis to all the places they visited and leaving everywhere uh, behind them testimony precious to us in the form of statues recently discovered which have revealed how widespread was the cult of the Egyptian goddess. The queen of navigation. So here you have a people who are supposed to be landlocked and can't swim actually being worshipped by the Greeks and Romans and, be, and opening up their, their, their season of navigation. <laughs> of Crete, as you can see in Simmut's tomb, showing the people from Crete bringing tribute to Egypt that they have learned from the Egyptians. The oldest known shipwreck in the world found, an Egyptian ship off the coast of Crete. National Geographic, not Brother Mathu. We move on, we can see Brother Jamal Gori standing there in Osiris, stands with his left foot forward, symbolizing the way of the heart, the way of truth, because the heart is on the left side of one's body. The way of truth, so that when, the, when they started learning from us, they started doing the sculpture just like us, left foot forward, the hands down, barren and naked. Learning the concept of the Osarian stance from that of the Egyptians. So mathematically, even they looked at it mathematically and found the same Canaan of the golden section, the golden numbers was there to control the statuary and art of ancient Crete was exact and identical to that of ancient Kemet. So can Africans navigate is the question that we've been asking. The Romans painted the priest of Egypt. When they painted the priest, they clearly differentiated the priest from themselves. As you can see, the black priest sprinkled throughout the crowd. The whites over here and the black priest here, the priest of Isis. <coughs> see them constantly. The Romans knew they were black. They painted them black. 
Move on, we can see the, the first boats in recorded history. These are the oldest paintings of any boat on the earth. Going back 4,000 BC in Nubia with the goddess, the symbol of the goddess Hathor here, the great mother here, again associated with navigation, this heritage coming all the way from the interior of Africa to Egypt, right to Greece, right to Rome. The queen of heaven, the queen of navigation, the queen of the waters. Here's the oldest boat known with a sail on it. Going back before 3000 BC, nowhere in the world did anybody even in the world paint a picture of a boat with a sail on it. Here's 3000 BC, a boat with a sail on it in Nubia, not in Egypt. And you can see, even in the spirit of the people there today, the little brothers, the little Nubians playing with boats because the Nile was the life of Egypt. There could be no life in Egypt without this river. It is this river that brought to them over 80 billion cubic tons of alluvium every year to give life to a barren desert. And it was in this alluvium that they planted their seed to grow their crops, to nourish their nation, to give their nation life. And they looked to the south, the place with the topsoil, the black Kemet, the rich and red, red and black earth that came to Egypt and gave life to it. They said that God put top the god Asaru Osiris sat on his great throne in the interior of Africa and they have blessed them today because they have sent them so much rich soil to give life to this barren desert which was Egypt. It only makes sense when you look to the interior of Africa. The whole thing doesn't make sense until you look into the interior of Africa. As you see King Tutankhamun, just like the small boy playing with the boat, when the first thing you saw on his tomb, the young boy king had boats that he played with because the river of life, that was the highway, that was the freeway, back and forth, up and down, all throughout the Mediterranean world. They were navigating, this is the only way they could be a strong nation for 3,000 years, is to have control of the waters like the United States had control of the air when they fought Saddam Hussein. There's no difference. They had to have control of the waters or Egypt wouldn't have stood three years, much less 3,000 years. When they died, they believed that they needed a boat to sail up the Nile to the interior of Africa, to God's land, and they buried the boats right along with them. Everything was centered around boats, life and death. Water was sacred. <laughs> Beautiful black bodies steadily stalk concrete streets, quietly concealing calypsoic currents amid camouflage identities. But stark naked reality testifies, as subtle as sunlight, cutting across carefully structured frames and boldly molded muscles, the truth, the truth cannot be denied, because heredity refuses to hide. Africans born in America bear striking resemblance, peaceful reminiscence of Egyptians, Nubians, Nusa, Fulani, we be Watusi tall, pygmy small, our ancestors constantly. get stories about people who have come into Africa and study. He was a young boy fleeing from Herod who was trying to murder him. And they said the young boy Jesus fled into Egypt to avoid his death. And then he came back out of Egypt. He was talking real revolutionary. Calling the Jews liars. Said you are liars and uh, the father of a lie. You are not the chosen people of God. Why did he say that? Because he'd gone into Egypt and learned that the Jews had learned this whole concept of religion right there in Egypt. And he was an Egyptian scribe himself. And so he came out doing what the Egyptians, of course, this is not him. <laughs> I want to make that clear. This is not him. I mean, the brother, he got these black priests, right? And so if the, if the, if the CIA or the Roman Legion, if you prefer, are looking for him and they want to find this brother, you can't he can't hide as a white, blind, blue-eyed, white person in the midst of all these shaven head black priests that I've been showing you that the Romans painted. They, the Romans painted the priests as black. So how can he be this color and run in there and hide amongst these priests from the Romans? The Romans weren't controlling the land at the time. It was just like today, a, a criminal can go into the Vatican for sanctuary and isolation, and the government of Rome can't do anything about it because the Vatican is its own state. 
So the one place that the Romans would not go into was the temples because it would irritate and, uh, and uh, would cause problems with the masses of the people if they desecrated the temples. It's the one place that he could go. Move on. So another man you may have remember called Moses, but you would think that this was a passage right out of the Bible, but this comes from the fourth dynasty of a, one of the magicians called Jedi Jedi Monk for the Pharaoh Khufu. And look what he does. There was, let me just set the situation up. There were some sisters doing a dance and one of them had lost the turquoise ne necklace into the water. And she became sad and stopped dancing. The Pharaoh said, what is the problem? I lost my necklace. He called on his priest and said, what can you do about it? Here, pick it up from there. Then said the chief lector, Jedi Jedi monk, his magic sayings, he placed one side of the water of the lake upon the other, and lying upon the parts that he found a fish-shaped charm. Then he, brought back, uh, and then he brought it back and gave it to his owner. Now as for the water, it was 12 cubits deep, and it amounted to 24 cubits after it was folded back. He said his magic sayings, and he brought back the water of the lake to its position. So here's a priest in Egypt, under the pharaoh Khufu, 2700 years BC, 4,700 years ago, parting water, long before Abraham, long before Moses, long before all those people who came in there and learned how to part some water. <laughs> so here you got Jesus walking on water. Moses parting the water. The Bible clearly said he studied for 40 years and all the wisdom of the Egyptians. You got Charleston Heston and Edmund G. Robinson standing over here at Universal Studio. part the Red Sea. Now we see where he learned how to part that Red Sea from, don't you? So the Egyptians were the masters of water. They saw their entire existence bordered and hinged on the concept of water. The water that the woman gave birth to the child as the inundation process began as the child came bellowing out of her interior. The concept of the water as they would sail up and down the highways doing commerce, then the south commerce in the north. And when they died and went to heaven, the boat to take them back to the interior of Africa. And later as they became gods in a bark, they would travel across the heavens in a boat. So they, if anybody on the face of the earth could make the trip to America, we know it was the Egyptians. Nothing could stop the Egyptians. So Thor Heyerdahl, European, he knew that. And so what he did, he, he looked at these boats, these Egyptian vessels, and he chose the most primitive type, the papyrus reed, and said, I'm going to prove that the ancient Egyptians could sell to America. This was his, this was his uh, calling. This is what he wanted to do. So you can see, he looked at the brothers, clearly see that they were brothers, and didn't look anything like him. And so what he did is he said, okay, they don't look like me. Let me go find some people who look like them. So he went to Chad in the interior of Africa, and he found some brothers who looked just like the brothers on the boats, who were making the same kinds of boats, and he brought these brothers back to Egypt and built a boat right in front of, right in front of the pyramids in Egypt. Why didn't we get this in class? <laughs> Did anyone teach us this in class? At the university, at the high school, at the junior college, at the elementary school, at the preschool, in the home. Nobody taught us this. So here's the, so in case you think I'm just jiving you, here's the pyramid and the boat in front of it, where they built the boat based on the Egyptian canyon right in front of the pyramids in Egypt. Heyerdahl understood that the reason that white folks couldn't get across to America and they thought the world was flat is that they were traveling against the currents. And that if you travel along the currents of, of uh, West Africa, the currents would bring you right to America. Anything that was able to stay afloat would come naturally to America. A bottle, a person, anything that could stay afloat would naturally come to America. He knew that. So he knew that white folks, in fact, had not discovered the whole world. As you see them here teaching their little kids that we discovered this, here it is, big finger right here on America. We discovered it. No brothers in sight. Got Magellan and Columbus and De Leon, and now they're discovering the universe. For the Europeans. For the Europeans. But the Dogon, as Brother Simi and Brother and Sister Alma have been to the Dogon land, they've already been out in the universe. That's a long story. We won't get into that. We'll let you look at his at that brother's lecture. We move on. So the white folks thought the world was flat, and you can see here, it's not Brother Batu making this up, in 1492, their science was in such a state that they believed that the world was flat and that if you sail off into the Atlantic, you'd fall off the edge of the earth, 
or be devour, devoured by some hideous monster. <laughs> this was the extent of their science at this particular time in the year 1492. But what made the Europeans want to navigate in 1492? All of a sudden you have Spain, the nation again like Greece, closest to Africa, sponsoring a navigational trip, an expedition to America. They don't teach us about the Moorish occupation that took place. For over 700 years, the Moors had controlled that particular land and brought about a renaissance, which they called the Renaissance. The Moors were there to the year 1492, the very year that Columbus set sail, Queen Isabella and Ferdinand expelled the Moors out of Spain. The same year he launched the ships to America. All over the East, they knew about Africans and their navigation. They had talked about Abubakar II and how he had sent 400 ships across the Atlantic to see what was across the Atlantic. In fact, not only did he send 400, but he got in the ship and sailed himself. We know this from a, a Moroccan historian who wrote about this in Cairo. This is 13, the year 1310, not 1492. So Columbus, or Colin, a Jewish background, a Jewish background, who were Jewish merchants selling throughout the Mediterranean, they got a hold of some of these stories. We know that this is what happened. This is why he got so interested in going to America to find this land which they called Atlantis in ancient times. So Hyredal knew this. So Hyredal took the same route that Columbus had learned about from the Moors. And the Moors had learned about from translating the Egyptian and the uh, Greek and Egyptian texts about navigation. They knew the world was round long before the Greeks knew the world was round, long before the Europeans knew the world was round. In Kemet, we knew the, the world was round. Imhotep knew the world was round. So here you can see Hyredal mapping out his course, how he was going to come to America. Got in his boat, just like he, he saw in the Kemetic museums, and he sailed to America. Not once, but twice. In Raw 1 and Raw 2. And he said, at this particular point, whenever one considers, whenever one considers who populated and who brought the first high culture to America, they would not be able to leave out the Egyptians because of his navigational experiences. That's important. So then we look at the reason for navigating. Why would the Egyptians want to navigate across the Atlantic? And again, if we go back to the Bible, maybe we'll find the answer here. As we can see, your tape just went off here. As we can see here, Marion and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. We, hear, hear, we see here in the Bible where Moses has married a black woman. Ethos being burnt and Opeth being faced, the black faced one. Moses has in fact married her. This is a fact. Now we're talking about a time when he was supposed to have a confrontation with a man named Ramesses. The 19th dynastic period, approximately 1200 or so years BC. It's just a coincidence that around 1200 BC, the first high culture was developed in the Americas. So Moses had married a black woman. Now what's interesting is that this particular pharaoh, Ramesses II, who he was supposed to have had his confrontation with, he also married an African or Nubian woman. Not that he wasn't African himself, but he married a woman that was from Nubia. A woman named Nefertari, which means more beautiful than beautiful. And she was his favorite wife. She was the most important woman in the Mediterranean world. And initially he married her for a treaty with the Nubians because at this time he was waging battles against the powers in the north, the Hittites, the Assyrians, and those who wanted to sack Egypt. As an alliance, he married this this daughter of the pharaoh of Nubia for an alliance, but he began to love her more than any of his wives. And so she became the most important woman in the Mediterranean world, this, this Nubian woman. In fact, the breadth of the Egyptian army was made up of Nubians from the south. In fact, the very name of the armies that they assigned to the armies in Egypt meant Nubian. There were so many, they were so numerous. So those brothers who were fighting the Assyrians, who were fighting the Hittites, composed mainly of Nubians from the south, brought in by this very important woman. So here you have Moses doing no different than the man he was supposed to have his confrontation with, marrying his sister from the south. So this gives you an idea that at this time, around 1200 BC, the Mediterranean is just flooded with Nubians, with blacks from the south, 
from Egypt and Nubia, fighting wars against the Syrians, selling up and down all the way. They found that the Egyptians were mining for tin in Ireland, in the British Isles. There's a, 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 an inscription of Taharqa in Spain they found, looking for metals to fight these people who had these uh, iron metals. So they were navigating all over the place looking for metals, looking for things to help them fight the barbarians from the north, as they called them. So you can see she was so important. She's the only queen, the first person in the world, long before the Taj Mahal, the first woman to have an entire temple built in her honor by the pharaoh himself. Ramesses standing side by side his Nubian queen, Nefertari. So Nubians all over the place. As you can see the boy King Tutankhamun as he's waging battle against the Assyrians. You can see the Assyrians here as they're falling down, being trampled by the horses, as the brothers from the south, from Nubia and Egypt, are coming and fighting off the barbarians who are coming in from the north. This is important because I'm just painting the picture here. So we'll stop here and we'll change over right quick and finish this thing up. Mediterranean world, approximately the time of 1200 BC. Because one of the positions that, that Vincent Sermon takes is that, that uh, it most probably was the 25th dynastic period that was responsible for the first high culture in the Americas. But I take basically the position that it could have been a period even earlier because of the events leading up to that. You can see here the Nubians were coming in already by the time of Ramesses II, composing the majority, a large part of the Kemetic armies and fighting throughout the Mediterranean world. So they were already there at this particular date. So they can't hold the difference in the time of which they usually assign to Nubian dates of between 700 and no more than 800 BC for the Nubian dynasty, which is the 25th dynasty. So they try to say that the high culture in the Americas makes an appearance in America several hundred years before the Nubians come to power in Egypt. So this is important to show that the Nubians were already in power in Egypt at this particular date. Can everybody see that? Is that clear? <laughs> This is the Gulf Coast. This is just a few kilometers down from the pyramidal site, which we call La Venta. And so sometime about 1200 BC, a little more, a little less, a foreign people came on this particular coastline. All the scholars who have studied America agree on this, that a foreign people came by way of the waters. As you can see, the jungle comes right up to the waters here. And in the midst of this particular jungle, they built the first pyramid in America. They all agree with this. The problem is, who were these farmers? Now, of course, as we saw all these pictures here when you came in here, to have this, if they would have their way as scholars, you have to throw all this out. You can't look at this and determine. They want more facts. Okay, so here it is. This is the first pyramid in America, approximately 100 feet in height. Just made an appearance on the Gulf Coast. 1200 BC, no antecedents, no origin and evolution of pyramid buildings, no, nowhere. There were no Mastaba tombs like there was in Egypt. A single tier, which became two tiers, which became three tiers, which became a step pyramid, which they put limestone to make a true pyramid, made it built a bent pyramid, a square pyramid, a round pyramid. There was no natural origin and evolution of pyramid building here in America. Just one day, 1200 BC, this pyramid showed up on the Gulf Coast. And so as I arrived just, just over a week ago, in La Venta, a couple of weeks ago anyway, right in the airport, Villa Hermosa, they have a mirror on the wall, and they show the La Venta complex facing the waters. Not only did they build it right here near the coast, but it's actually facing the waters from which these people had come. At what point does possibility become probability? We want to add these things up. It doesn't take anything but really just basic math or something like this. Those currents we saw are coming right over to the coast. You got all these faces right here, and you have this pyramid here, and nowhere else in the world are people building pyramids but from where these currents are coming from. And so here's a model of the pyramid as they estimated it appeared when it was actually you know, in use. 
And you can see clearly it was a true pyramid truncated without a capstone on it. So here you had a true pyramid and a step pyramid and a ceremonial center with land use classification all intact, all in one spot with no origin and evolution right there on the coast. Just raising issues here. So this particular civilization, La Venta, on the coast, the Gulf Coast of Mexico, is the parent civilization of the Mayas, the parent civilization of the Zapotecs, the Mixtecs, the Tonatecs, the Toltecs, all the Tecs, all of them, and the Mayas, they all go back to this parent civilization. All the scholars agree on that. The Mayan scripts have been deciphered to some extent, and they now know that there were Omac uh, glyphs that predated the Mayan glyphs, in which the Mayans got their glyphs from. The calendar of the Maya and the Aztec, all the text, goes back to the Olmec calendars. And so right in your hotels there in, in, uh, in Mexico, they don't hide it from you. La Venta, this site dating back to 1200 BC, brought to light some of the most provocative finds in all of Mexico. Enormous sculpted basalt heads with distinctly Negroid features that still puzzle archaeologists to this day. <laughs> because they know that there was a galley slaves. They only, could only be galley slaves. They couldn't be gods and priests. <laughs> the heads are attributed to the Olmecs, often called the spark civilization of Mesoamerica, the igniters of a creative blossoming that spreads to other cultures. However, the unique style and physical features of the Olmec heads were never imitated and remain a mystery. But see, this is one of the most important points. These heads were never imitated. That means that when they came here, there was a unique experience, a unique situation. These were unique people with unique features who came in and flourished and then disappeared. Showing you clearly that this is a foreign people. The Mayas don't look like this. The Aztecs don't look like this. The Toltecs don't look like this. None of them look like this. This is a foreign incursion in Mexico. So here you can see the pyramid in La Venta, and this was a very rare picture I, I was able to find. It actually shows the layout of La Venta, and it actually shows the place where they had the colossal heads. A colossal head here, you can see three at the top. In front of the pyramid, they found at this first pyramid, yes, some of these heads facing the waters of the currents that are coming from a land that you would anticipate having these features. And one thing I want you to notice also is they had burials here. You can see a sarcophagus at the top. And they also did a, uh, a test of this particular mound. And they now believe that there's a tomb inside this pyramid, in the center of this pyramid at La Venta. So you can't say it was just a temple. This particular pyramid was a tomb, just like it was done in Kemet. And so here's one of the faces that was found in that particular area features that were alien to the Aztecs, the Mayans, and all the other texts in that area. Completely alien features here at La Venta. And I like to shoot the profiles of them because a lot of times they like to just shoot them straight on so you can't see the prognathous jaw, the thick lips, and the noses, the characteristics, again, that you would anticipate amongst African people and African people in the diaspora. We move on, we can see here, as my wife sits here, you can see clearly her features in conjunctions of the features here. Again, a totally, look at the problem like this jaw here and the lips here, completely alien, completely alien to that of the Americans, the Native Americans here. Now look at the profile here, look at this, look at the jaw here. Now I take you to Kemet, to Hermacus. People in the world who are sculpting massive stone heads anywhere in the world other than this, and they're building pyramids. And uh, this particular one here, uh, one one called a monkey. Somebody called a monkey. So I shot this picture, and I wanted to show you what they what they said about this particular one in the, in, in the book as I read. Uh, this basalt pillar topped by by a face staring towards the sky is one of the enigmas of the Olmec world. Again, uh, another enigma, a uh, puzzle or something, right? What is this creature apparently lost in contempla contemplation of the heavens? Is it a star worshiper or an astronomer? 
Is it a man or could it be an animal? Some specialists have suggested, in fact, that it is a monkey. <laughs> so I said, okay, let me take a picture of this thing here. I could. And look at this. Look at the lips. And look at the ears. Look at the afro. No monkey has ever had an afro like this one. <laughs> you can even see the hair. Like, he looks like he has sideburns. <laughs> and his arms are in the position behind his head, showing that he's supporting his neck as he's looking into the heavens. Now what was a monkey do looking into the heavens like this? <laughs> so he's puzzled by this piece. Enigma. Then right across the ocean where the currents are coming to this particular region, you find the very features in this land that they refuse to recognize even the possibility of these people coming across to America. Completely alien, completely foreign features. One time, a spark. So, Professor uh, J. M. Melger uh, wrote a paper here in Mexico in 1871. 1871 about the De La Cabeza, Colossal de Tipo Ethiopico, the Colossal Ethiopian Stone Face that he had, he had witnessed too. So I'm not going to leave you to uh, hang it. I'm going to put, you, put it all in English. And, 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 and as the scholars would say, in no uncertain terms. We're going to put it in no uncertain terms. On my arrival at the Hacienda, speaking as Mel, Melger, at, my, at the Hacienda, I asked the owner to take me to look at it. We went, and I was struck with surprise. As a work of art, it is, without exaggeration, a magnificent sculpture. But what astonished me uh, was the Ethiopic type represented. I reflected that there had undoubtedly been Negroes in this country, and that this had been the first epoch of the world. Now here's an anthropologist back in 1871 who has come to this conclusion and has, has written papers on it. But this has been hidden from us. Matthew Sterling, they're just digging these things up all over the place in that area, all around the Gulf Coast. Standing there, all standing there in shock, looking at it. Oh, here's another one. <laughs> <laughs> then he starts measuring it, looking at the nose, knowing it's nothing like his nose. Look at his nose. Look at his nose. And look at the nose on this. Look, look at his lips and look at the lips on this. Look at his cheek. And his receding cheek, here's a prognathous cheek, all of the dimensions that he's measuring, clearly seeing that this is different. And his original position was that these were African, and when the scholarly world, the schools and universities, and then the supporting money got to him, he changed his story, Mr. Matthew Sterling. Yeah. How can you get a face like that? But in Africa. <laughs> in fact, they called this head Joe Lewis when they saw it because Joe Lewis was a heavyweight champion at the time that this head was found. And so I put Joe Lewis here so you can see why they call that face Joe Lewis. And Joe Lewis was wearing him a helmet too at that time. Just digging them up in the swamps, walking around, tripping over them, stumbling over them, finding them all over the place. The tinge on the lips, the nose, the jaw, the same continuous. All of them wearing war helmets. This particular site here called Kamakalko, which is also near La Venta, probably no, no more than 50 miles from that particular area, but some 15 to 1700 years separate these two buildings. This is Maya. This is classic Maya. This is the only building that the Mayans built out of bricks in the entire land, which is a puzzle to me too. Just one day near the coast, the Mayans jumped up and built a brick pyramid and never built another one. And there's no history of it, of them having ever built one before. A, a fire brick. Not just some brick they let sun dry, but they fired the brick. And you can see here, he's holding up the brick here, showing you what they built it out of, out of brick. And what's important also about this site even though there's a period of time of maybe 15 to 1700 years to separate these two sites, Leventa and this site, it's continuous. The theme is continuous. 
the, uh, the urban planning, the structure, the architecture, all of it, the theme of the ceremonial center goes all the way back to that of the Omec. You remember the two arms of the village that you saw in La Venta? They have the two arms here, the pyramid in the center, and they also had burials in this particular site. Again, dispelling the rumor, the rumor and the myth that these were only temples and not tombs. As you can see, the two arms of the village at La Venta, the basic theme prevailed. There are buildings underneath this, they haven't even dug it up yet. You can see them here. Here's the seven wonders of the world. Only wonder of the seven wonders you don't have to wonder about. Right there in Kemet, the first monumental structure made by man. Over almost 3,000 years BCE, 5,000 years ago, the light tower is gone. The hanging towers of Babel, gone. The Statue of Rose, gone. All those wonders of the world, gone. The first wonder is still there. So all the pyramids of the earth, if this hypothesis holds up, goes back to this particular pyramid, the pyramid designed by the multi-genius Imhotep for the pharaoh Zosa in the third dynastic period in Egypt. Again, whether it's Teotihuacan, the step pyramid of Zosa, or the pyramidal superstructures even in India, which we haven't even got into, go back to this particular type or this particular pyramid. The Great Pyramid of Khufu. As you see, they experiment with every type of pyramid. The true pyramid, one looks like a gambrel roof. Square pyramids. And even had stellar stones around the pyramid, which is something that is really mind-blowing because you see the stellar stones here. Because a lot of the American pyramids also have stellar stones in front of them these ideas you see coming over here and we're not supposed to look at the parallels. We're not supposed to add these things up. And you can see again all the pyramids throughout Kemet and also Nubia. As you see these pyramids in Nubia, look at all those pyramids in the background. Every one of them has a temple attached to the tomb. So we're talking about temple tomb complexes. We're not talking about just burials. Again, if you look carefully, this is not just a temple, it's a mortuary temple. And right next to this particular temple was a temple designed by Mentu Hotel, who preceded the Queen Hatshepsut. He was in the 11th dynasty. Hatshepsut was in the 18th dynasty who designed the other temple. So here you can see again the pyramidal superstructure in conjunction with the temple, again a temple tomb concept. Constant. So as I climbed these steps at Palenque, I had this in mind. The priest king Pakal here. As you can see, here's a passage that you can walk right down the, the tomb here, inside the tomb, and down inside the temple, buried like a pharaoh in Kemet, was the priest king Pakal, just like the Great Pyramid. Here's a sarcophagus, Pakal. With, with inscriptions. They call this the temple of inscriptions. No one else in the world making sarcophagus like this. But the brothers and sisters in ancient Kemet. So at what point does possibility become probability is a question I want to continue to ask. The biggest problem with this particular civilization, again with the Mayan civilization, is that heretofore they had saw the Maya as basically coming into existence basically between 300 BC and 100 BC for the, for the uh, antecedents of that civilization. Then they have the classic period, the post-classic and so forth and so on that runs into the century. So they were saying that there was too much time to separate the Maya from the Egyptians to, to draw these particular types of parallels. So this was a critical problem. Because here you found pyramids, you found mastaba type pyramids here in Kamakako. In this area, you actually found a burial. In, this, in these uh, cylindrical clay uh, containers, they actually buried the dead in fetal positions, right at the base of the pyramid here. So there was no problems with the burials. As you can see one of the burials here that came, in fact, this is the museum right there on that site, where they actually show it was removed from its fetal position and placed in the, in the uh, museum there. So they had burials in conjunction with their pyramids. As we, we see in the very beginning, the first pyramid in America has a sarcophagus and also a burial, as they stated recently, that there's most likely a tomb inside this particular pyramid. This is 
important evidence because this evidence here has just recently come out in the last, last year. It just recently came out last year. There's a new site, a new Mayan site called Negbi, which is northern Guatemala, which if you look at the scale, is just a little bit over 100 miles from Tabasco from La Venta. And at this particular site, they found the oldest Mayan site to date. This site has been dated between 500 and 600 BC. This is a very important find because what it does is it brings the Mayan civilization, all these elements that we've been witnessing that are so similar to that of ancient Kemet, it brings them closer to that date of the Omeka, which again runs from 1200 BC to about 500 BC. So here you have the Maya at the mainstream and we're at the very end of the Omec civilization becoming the power in this particular land. So you can see here the relationship between the, the Maya as the Omeka begin to give way, the Maya begin to come into power. 600 BC, this is incredible because they now, they're gonna have to rewrite all their books. <laughs> Up to now they said the Maya didn't come into existence until 200 to 300 BC. So this brings the Maya within the mainstream of the influence of the Omeka. So this will account for many of the similarities that we see that they have been able to conveniently keep away up to now. Here's an illustration of that site. It was a bad illustration in the paper, but this is all I, had, I could get my hands on. Just announced last year, uh, around February or March. So then you can see the Maya, uh, where you can see when in the process of conquest, as they treat their prisoners of war by the grabbing of the hair, this is a theme that we see all over Kemet. As the pharaohs, as they go after the Assyrians and the Hittites and various enemies, the, the symbol of submission was to grab one by the hair. So you can see in the art and the iconography in America, the same processes in the art coming over here in the Maya. Again, that date being a very important date because it brings the Maya within the mainstream of the Olmec influence. This is important. Over and over again, you see the same symbol of submission by grabbing the hair that you saw in Kemet throughout the Nile Valley. This one being at the great temple of Mendelisi uh, in southern Egypt, the brother of Osiris, a Nubian temple. And it goes all the way back to the, the, the palette of Narmer, as you can see in the very beginning as they came down from the south from pre-dynastic times and forged the first great city in Kemet. Again, that art, that symbol was already there in prevalence. So nobody can question who had it first. The war helmets. Remember we said in the beginning at 1200 BC that Ramesses was recruiting Nubians to fight in his army. He married a Nubian woman who became the most important woman in the Mediterranean world. So Nubians were all over the Mediterranean world fighting the battles with the Egyptians side by side, navigating all over the place looking for precious metals for weapons to fight the Hittites, the Assyrians, all those people from the uh, north who were coming down. And so the helmets that were being wore are very much like the helmets that were being wore by the Nubians. As you can see the Pharaoh Taharqa with the war helmet here. As again, uh, Van Wouten now uh, from his book, uh, Unexpected Faces in America. In fact, Compton College, uh, years ago, Brother Ranuka Rashidi and others who were working there had uh, Von Wooten now come to Compton College. I don't know, this is quite a few years ago. And uh, he was able to point out a number of these particular uh, coincidences, the so-called coincidences, which is obviously that there's a connection here of the war helmet and the facial features here. Only in Africa, again, can you anticipate this type of facial expression, the prognathous jaw, the thick lips, the broad nose, these, these signs and symbols are all over Africa, but these are things that we're just supposed to discard and not consider. The war helmet again consistently. I mean, this, this, this one here is just, it's paralyzing. And to look at the face, it's fierce. They're no nonsense type people. <laughs> Again, obviously, the, the, what he, Van Sertima has brought to our attention, the braids, the braids in conjunction with the features. I mean, who else is cornrowing? Bo Derek wasn't around at this time. <laughs> and I took a picture of my little girls back over here just to drive home the point. You know, these are cultural characteristics of these people. These features are, are characteristics of our people. They go hand in hand. To find this head in America 
pre-Columbian and part of the Olmec civilization is a testimonial to who these foreign people were. You have to consider this evidence. In this particular site, Tautielco, they found this. Look at the afro on this face, on this head. Look at the afro. The peppercorn hair, as they call it. The lips, the nose. Again, who, hel who, hel who else in the world has this type of feature? Turn around and look at each other. <laughs> Tautielco is one of the very places that Andrus Worsinski did analysis of skeletons here in that particular site. And so in conjunction with this with this art, he found African skeletons that date back to Olmec times. Skeletons. Cranoscopically taking measurements of the skulls here at Teltioko, the same place you found that art, the art with the African face, they found the African skeletons there. And in 1974, at a conference in Mexico, he announced the discovery and he wrote, it appeared that some of the skulls from Teltioko Sierra de las Masas and Monte Alban, all pre-classic sites in Mexico show a different, show to a different degree a clear pre prevalence of the total Negroid pattern that has been evidenced by the use of two methods, multi, uh, uh, multivariate distance analysis of average characteristics of individual fractions distinguished cranioscopically, B, analysis of frequency distributions of mean index of the position between combinations of racial varieties. Dr. Ben, where are you? <laughs> okay, putting it in the simplest terms, measured the cranium, found that the cranium of the skulls found in this particular tomb was identical to that of not the Negrito types in uh, Southeast Asia, but of the continental African types. And the, and the uh, variations, as far as the variations are concerned, in many cases, in many instances, he was able to find the African skeleton laying next to the Native American skeleton, a female in most cases, and you can see clearly and could differentiate clearly between the skull of the African and that of the Native American. So this is all he is saying. And, but he, had, he was at a conference, so he had to use that term. So we here, so we don't have to use that, those terms today. And so it was brought to my attention here at Ushmal that this particular pyramid was built by dwarfs. Seven dwarfs. I said, well, dwarfs? I mean, the Mayan were already, already small people, but they're writing about people who were smaller than themselves. So I said, well, let me just, before I explode, let me just check this thing out further. And then, uh, sure enough, you found that the dwarf, as the Mayans would consult the dwarf, the dwarf was in power. He was in, he was in control of nature. As you see him holding the bird, the symbol of the spirit in his hand. He was the guardian of the spirit world, just like that in ancient Kemet, the Twa. So here we are, we got the concept of the Twa, or the pygmies in a land where there are no Twa's and no pygmies. This is important. We move on, we can see here that in Kemet you can see the Pharaoh, as the Pharaoh went to the other world, he assumed the position of best Horus, the Twa, the pygmy, and he did the dance of God before Osiris, and with the spirit of the Twa, he could trample on the animals. He could hold all the animals that we, that we were afraid of, that we feared, the scorpions, the serpents, the snakes, the lions, all these animals associated with our fears, he was in control over now because he was the spirit and guidance of the Twa, who were the dancers of the god Osiris. So here you can see this concept of controlling nature by the dwarf or the Twa or the pygmy was consistent here in America as well as in Africa. Moving on, you can see again, they call the Twa the dancers of God because they live in the midst of the forest, in the midst of all the things that we fear. And they show him standing on top of the lotus flower, on top of the papyrus flower, symbolizing his control and his association with nature itself. The inundations that come down from the interior of Africa, from the forest regions of Africa, from the sources of the Nile River, is where these people do this dance. This is important. And so here you can see the Mayan. Look at him. Clearly distinct, look at the features of the Mayan, look at the nose of the Mayan as he consults the little Twa who is seated in the plant. He is at one with this particular plant. Going back to the Twa here, standing on the lotus flower in Kemet, taking on the same uh, attributes that you see here in America. Now look at the nose and the lips on the Twa. The artist, clearly, I'm an artist, I do sculpture. He clearly differentiated the features of the Twa from that of the Mayan. Can you see that? If you can't, let's take a closer look. Can you see it? Now look at this codus. Here's a codus, much like the Papyrus of Hunefer, that is showing the races of men 
as understood by the Mayans. This is important because these are the types that were here in America at this time. They all showed them the same complexion but variations in their features. One has the hook nose much like the Mayan that you just saw. But then when you came to the foreigner, and look, he's tied and bound. He's a prisoner. And he's black. And look at his lips. So they're clearly differentiating this type, which is a black, who is being held captive and prisoner, and they've emphasized his lips, showing you clearly they understood that this was a foreigner, a different complexion right there in their land. And in, in their art, even this particular piece, as they sculpted this piece, they actually put black tar on it. My mind could walk through this door. You can go just at random, grab anybody out there and bring them in here, and they'll say, yeah, there's some strong black stuff going on in this building. <laughs> go grab some of the white folks walking around the corner and come over and see if, ask them, tell them that this is from Ghana and see if they can tell the difference. <laughs> So just like the Twa in the interior of Africa, the dancers of God, those who played the music for Osiris, the features of the Twa are the features of the Twa that you find here in America. Shown so many years ago playing the harp, playing the music, doing the dance of God. In fact, they were so highly venerated that the Egyptians put them on the houses called Mamisi, which is the birth house of the gods the place where the gods are born. Every religious site in, in Kemet had a Mamisi, whether it was at Dendera, whether it was at Philae, at Abydos, every site had a Mamisi which represented the place where the gods were born. And the place that the gods were born, as we have stated from the beginning, was the interior of Africa, the place where the river was born, the place where the soul returns back. And so it was these little twa, these pygmies, who did the dance for Osiris in the interior, in the forest region, and then in the Yucatan Peninsula, they told me that the Twa there, the dwarfs, were the guardians of the forest, the guardians of the soul. So when you see Disneyland sticking up Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, you know where they're copying this stuff from here, right off the Mamisi houses here. See, all these traditions go into Europe by way of Africa. Snow White and the, and the Seven Dwarfs. The pot of gold on the other side of the rainbow where the leprechauns is. The pot of gold is in Nubia, is in Ethiopia where the gold is. This is where the rainbow is. So these are St. Patrick who drove out the snakes. There are many books of uh, uh, Richie, uh, uh, ancient and modern Britons. Uh, J. Uh, J. Rogers, many of his works, his, he has cited these things. The traditions that come out of Africa that permeate throughout Europe. And so you find the same traditions permeating throughout the Americas, brought in at a time when Africans were in conflict with foreigners, at a time that they were navigating, and at a time that a pyramid shows up in America, and you can't account for pyramids in any other place but in Africa. So you can see Bess Horace again, as Churchward calls it, the first god anthropomorphically depicted is the primitive human form of Horus in the form of a twa here. Best Horus, the elder Horus, holding in his hand the symbol of the lotus flower, symbol of water, symbol of the great river, symbol of birth. The birthing house again is associated with the twa. And so you find in Mexico, even when uh, you find that a dwarf has been born naturally in Mexico, he becomes associated with these guardians of the forest. And you can see him holding in his hand a cactus plant. Again, cactus like the lotus flower, when you're in the desert, it represents what? Water. Water. Again, the same kinds of symbology associated, holding the lotus flower or holding the cactus, again in association with birth, in association with waters. All these parallels are too close. At what point does possibility become probability? As we read about this, in many ancient and surviving Indian cultures, dwarfs are considered miraculous beings of the earth and mountains, capable of transforming themselves from human into other forms, including sacred plants. In Oaxaca, where divine mushrooms are still used in rituals, they often appear as little men or dwarfs bearing both male and female characteristics. This particular piece dates back to 100 BC. Now that's important because uh, when you look at, read Jomo Kenyatta's face in Mount Kenya. When the Maasai and the Kikuyu came down from the mountain area to settle in the plains, the Twa were living there, which they call a Goomba, and these people, they said they were miraculous because they were able to disappear into the earth. So this characteristic of being the people of the earth and people of vegetation and resource, 
This was universal throughout Africa. And so again, you find it right here in America, in a place that there were no pygmies. <laughs> As Gerald Massey writes in Ancient Egypt, Law of the World, talking about Ptah and his workers, his pygmy workers hollowed out the underworld. Amenta was based upon the mine. It was a secret earth in which the treasures were concealed. So again, the Tuar always associated with the underworld, with hollowing out tunnels and going, being able to disappear. You know, in fact, Harak, well, I wish we had more time. I can't even tell you the story, but as we go on, we can see that the place that they lived in this particular forest was at the interior of Africa, at the dead center portion of Africa. In fact, on the equator, which they call Acre. Acre is where we get the word et, which means equator or equal. And so this place, Osiris could sit here at Ruanzori, Kilimanjaro, the mountains of the moon as they call it, and peer over into the forest and watch the Twa do the dance of God. The pharaohs are in boats now, it's coming down and now in the boat, the souls journeying back to the, come to rest in the, in the land of reeds, the land of rushes, which is a great sud region filled with papyrus plants and thickets. It is this sud area that ships the uh, papyrus and lotus to Egypt to give Egypt life every year. So the whole religion is a process that takes place in nature. They saw the inundation process, the Egyptians said the Nile River came from heaven. It's the clouds, you can see Kilimanjaro, Mount Kenya, towering above the clouds. The clouds are pouring water from heaven into the valley here, creating the large inundation, sending the alluvium and topsoil 4,100 miles from Egypt and 3,700 miles from Ethiopia, bringing life to Egypt. The whole process of the religion is here, and all of a sudden you got some people in Mexico talking about some guardians of the forest, some little people, and they don't even exist over there. <laughs> And then they tell you that these people came who founded their civilization from across the waters. So look at the geological processes that are responsible for the stories that you have. In the interior of Africa, I said that this black earth and silk came from the mountains, the volcanoes in the interior of Africa. They call this black burning rock Kim, and they showed it as a symbol burning. It was in this area that the volcanoes would go off and create, you know volcanoes create the richest soil in the world. Go to any island that's created by a volcano, you find all kinds of wildlife, vegetation, because it's the richest soil in the world. So this soil is created, and when the rain comes, it washes this alluvium down to Egypt, and you can see clearly Egypt was a barren land, and it gives life. So ta Tenen, the raised land, the land, that's the, the land of the ancestors, ta Netherland, was the land where the soil was being shipped by the gods as a blessing to the Egyptians. I can't emphasize that enough, because we're going to come home to a point here. You can see here again the concept, the principle of the magma from the interior, from the underworld. You can see the clouds, as the clouds surround the mountain. This is where Osiris' throne was, where he could sit as the judge of the underworld. He's sitting in heaven, but yet he's on earth. They show you this in the drawings. He's on earth, but he's in heaven. He's at the place where the Nile is born, the place where the gods are born. This is the place where the souls have to tread on fire if they're found to be unjust. This is the legendary lake of fire that comes to us in the scripture and Bible. This is the place of the judgment scene. Lake Victoria, which they call it, or Mwanza. This is the legendary lake of fire that they talked about. As you can see here, Atam, as they told the story, the primeval hill Ptah rose up, and Atam fire rose and set on the hill, and the process of creation came about. Look at the islands in the South Pacific. Fire is begetting life. The raised land. So pyramid, you can find in the etymology of words, pyra means fire. Mid is the mound. The mound of fire is what the Greeks call the pyramid. Even though the Egyptians didn't call it that, it shows you that the Greeks understood the references that the Egyptians made to those structures. The mid, the mound of fire, the pyramid. And so in Mexico City, this was in, 19, in 1986. Walking through here, one of the guys said that this uh, temple here was designed after the volcano in the background. You can see the volcano in the background. So the pyramids in Mexico took on the same meaning that they had in Kemet, the house of fire, the mound of fire. And it was in the center of the world that Osiris sat on his throne in the judgment of the dead. And it was in the center of this particular place that they developed this 
called Teotihuacan, which literally means the place or the house where the gods are born. Go read it or any book on Mexico will tell you that Teotihuacan means the house where the gods are born. And not far from that was the lake at Tenochtitlan in which the Aztecs founded their ceremonial center with the same concepts behind the buildings there. The equinoctial lions symbolizing the equator, uh, equinoctial symbols identical in meaning with similar Mayan glyphs in Yucatan. The two lions represent Shu and Tefnut, guardians of the stability of the rising equinoctial sun. Here you can see right here in Uxmal in the governor's palace. Take a picture of this. You can see the lions back to back or the jaguars. They had no zoo types called lions. So they used the jaguar, the great cats. Again, they put an emphasis on cats like the so-called societies, uh, cults as the Europeans call them in West Africa, the jaguar societies, the lion societies. All, again, all of a sudden you find the same emphasis on the large cats in Mexico. The symbol of Akar, the symbol of the equinoctial rising sun, the symbol of the equator, the symbol of the place where the gods are born. Palenque. Again, the cats, again, nobody had more cats than we did throughout Africa. Cats were venerated leopards and lions all over the continent. The jaguar became the symbol of power here in Mexico, as the lion was the symbol of power in Kemet. We began to close out there. Priests began to adorn themselves in the regalia that you would expect to see in Kemet. As you see the symbol of the serpent, not only on the shield behind him, but the uraeus above his head and wearing the skin of the jaguar. Looks like a scene right out of the tomb, tomb of King Tanakhamen, as he wears the, the, the skin of the, of the leopard with the uraeus on his helmet here. Again, coming from the interior of Africa, the cultural unity of Africa's Diop has emphasized time, and time again, all we need to do is read his books the crooks and the flail, the ostrich feathers, the leopard skin. This is in Uganda, the heart of Africa. This is where this stuff is coming from. But they worshiped us as gods. They didn't make fun of us as priests. And when they showed the sun, they showed the sun. Deformation of the head, something that's done all over West Africa. Well, made a mistake here, but you can get the point. <laughs> In fact, look at the earring here and go back and look at the ear here. It's almost identical. You can see the deformation that took place. They do this at birth. When the child is born, they, they uh, fasten sticks and they tie it in some manner so that they can create the shape when the, brain, when the skull is still soft. So you can see it's done all over Africa, particularly in West Africa cultural characteristics coming across to America. When you look at something like this, then you understand how something like this gets to America pre-Columbian. Again, they're rep the artists are representing things that they understood, things that they could differentiate from themselves. You can see much of it still here even to this day as you go into the Amazon and you find these things being done that are being done nowhere else but in Africa. So this is uh, our final slide. And as I opened up, you know, I, I encouraged uh, many of you brothers and sisters, particularly the younger ones, to uh, be persistent and per persevere to, to search and search for truth. And none of us really stand on our own. All of us learn from others. This was a conference I attended in 1987. And I just wanted to share a little something with you. Because over the years, I have sat in the audience for years and years and years at Compton College, at various universities around, around the, uh, not only around the city, but around the country as well. And I've, at times, I can recall when people like uh, Legrand Plague and Ronoko Rashidi and others would be speaking. There would maybe be five people in there. Or look, Brother Majid, or Sister Old Wally knows about that. She's been around here, you know, doing the same thing. And nobody would come out. But they continued to do their work. And now, you know, these people are pretty much known as who's who. There are other unsung heroes, people that you don't even know about, like Cheka Abubakari, you know, brothers like that, and uh, Brother uh, uh, Asar Jabal, people you've never heard of. But these are people that contributed to my growth, 
contribute to my development. And so when you see Brother Mathieu speaking or offering some, some information to someone else, it's not in and of myself that I come, but it's because of others who have cared enough, even when there were only four or five people that came out, to go ahead and go through with it. That's why when I met Brother Femi, I told him at his house that night, the brother told you that we sat down and we went through my slides. The brother said, well, brother, I had invited a few other people here, and it's just my wife and myself. And at the time, was an engineer that I worked with in his architectural office, a brother by the name of Nor Mel Nor Sinioko from uh, Guinea. And so he was there that night. And, uh, and so he said, well, brother, what I can do is I can have you back to do the lecture. And I said, no, brother, we're going to go through these slides tonight. I said, uh, I don't care if it was just you and me or it was just me. In fact, if you can get a pack of dogs and sit down and listen, I'll lecture to them. <laughs> but this is the approach that we have to take when we're dealing with the truth. Because every time that you go over material, it makes you that much better for the next. And so these brothers and sisters of John Henry Clarks and Richard Keynes and all the ones that you see on the panel who are out here doing the work, all of us can be the byproduct of the work that they're doing, and consequently, these younger brothers here can be the byproducts of what we're doing, and eventually, like Dr. King has said, we shall overcome. Thank you, brothers and sisters. <laughs>